Hello, and welcome to Resilient Security in a Remote World. This is about using asymmetry for defenders, as opposed to the historical and some might say dominant reality in the cyber world where asymmetry favors the attackers. I think we're all tired of hearing that there are those who've been hacked and those who don't know it. And so uh, for, with that said, our goal is to try to get to a more resilient security profile and to more resilient security in general. My name is Sam Curry. I'm the Chief Security Officer for Cyber Reason, and I'm a visiting fellow at the National Security Institute. Uh, it is my great pleasure to speak to you today uh, as a security professional, and I really am passionate about the mission uh, that I have personally to try to reverse this advantage that attackers have and to try to equip defenders all over the world in a community of defenders to try to be more effective and to expect victory in cyber conflict. So the agenda for today is we'll look at the role of cyber and what is it that cyber is supposed to do for us? What are some of the changes we can expect with a new environment? And uh, perhaps a little bit into how attacks are evolving and what does it look like when this is done well? So our goal in cyber is in fact to stop threats. Uh, it's not to win uh, the detection contest. It's not to find the most esoteric of threats. It is to get these as close to the point of origin as possible. The term breach, I think, is abused in the public eye. We tend to say things like uh, uh, infrastructure breach and mean the exact same thing as a material breach or a simple leakage of information on the part of uh, perhaps an HR professional. And so I think it's really important to say that there's a big difference between when an infrastructure is penetrated and when something bad is done. And that it is our goal in security, yeah, first of all, to be compliant and to follow regulations and rules. Uh, secondly, to put the right reference architecture in place to be as resilient and, and to prevent as much as possible. But we also would be deluding ourselves if we didn't realize that the bad guys are adaptive and that they seek to try to get around any defenses we put up. And so we must look for them, realizing the most ingenious of opponents is not any machine ever made, it's human beings. And our job in cyber, the main function for why we exist is to stop those human beings. Uh, we, actually, uh, we actually have only a few places in business and in government where we deal with human beings. That's why there's conflict, legal conflict, perhaps in business it's uh, sales conflict as you go to market against competitors. Uh, perhaps there's actual adversarial conflict sometimes between nation states. But it is to stop the most insidious of threats, the people on the other end. And we want to do that faster and more completely. We want to do it closer to the point of origin with less delay in the system. There is a cycle uh, that takes place when we try to prevent and we will fail somewhere. Um, no one has yet solved the Turing challenge and created an AI that can prevent perfectly, although that is the goal we seek. Um, instead, there is a delay between when something, someone gets into an environment um, and when we detect them and then when we ultimately resolve it. And we wanna do this faster and more completely. Um, Hollywood has done us a bit of a disservice. Uh, we often see a hacker in a movie uh, who is typing and hits the enter key and says, I'm done, it's over. Um, it actually takes much longer than that to affect the most insidious of attacks. Now, yes, ransomware might hit you and hurt you right away, but those typically lead to perhaps some brand damage, perhaps uh, um, some losses um, due to customer confidence and, and, uh, and, and direct fines or even perhaps the payouts you have to make. But the really damaging things are the deep um, ownership of networks that get compromised. And that's what we're trying to stop faster and more completely. Pursuing, of course, ultimately doing it all as prevention but, uh, uh, and even getting predictive, but that isn't the reality. We have to face the fact that whatever wall we build, somebody will find a way around it. And here's the key. We have to align to the business as we do this. I sometimes say uh, quite publicly, the biggest problem in security isn't detection and it's not even remediation. It is the lack of alignment between security departments and uh, their business uh, colleagues and associates. I have never met a security uh, agenda or portfolio that didn't benefit by being more closely tied to what businesses ultimately care about. And if you're in government, there's still a business. It's just, it is an agenda. It is a political agenda um, that might be budget related or resource related or strategic. 
it is alignment between the mission of an organization and the security department that needs to be tightest. And very often, that's simply not the case. Um, so let's consider some changes to the environment. What has happened? Um, uh, the most obvious um, changes, if we don't look at the, uh, if we look prior to 2020, which is, it feels like it's been a very long year, um, but prior to 2020, we had things like cloud adoption. Um, we have uh, we had increasing mobility among users. Um, we have new platform types, especially with new generations entering the workforce, and new application types, especially delivered as a service. Um, and so we have moved generally from being custodians of infrastructure to being brokers of infrastructure. And uh, these changes have made it very difficult to do the confidentiality, integrity, availability, and non-repudiation in our environments that is security. And now, of course, we're seeing more and more requirements laid it on to the backs of security professionals, and particularly around things like privacy. Um, so then we hit 2020 and everything changes. Uh, we, uh, we started the year uh, with a bang, and uh, we have proceeded with COVID-19 uh, really dominating headlines and driving us all home. And so uh, that, that cannot be ignored. We have gone from progressively going more remote, which is, of course, uh, one of the main points of this conversation, to being almost fully remote. We went from a work-in-the-office environment to a work-from-home environment. And more and more, we are, in fact, heading into a work-from-anywhere world. Um, but we also have seen tensions geopolitically. Uh, we have seen trade wars. We have seen macroeconomic reduction. We have seen fights over the IP associated with COVID-19. Uh, and we have seen things like botnets and bit mi Bitcoin mining or, and even a presidential election in the United States with potentially global ramifications. And so it is impossible to discuss cyber without in some form, way, shape or form, looking at the wider, um, at the wider uh, context. So what did yesterday's enterprise look like? I think it's fair to say that yesterday's enterprise was dominated by a perimeter. Um, I think we've heard for 15 or 20 years the perimeter is dead, but it wasn't. It's still there. It still exists. To some extent, it shrank. It got closer to the user. It got closer to the user's device. Um, but we still fundamentally had a trusted and a not trusted zone. And so if you look at yesterday's enterprise, I think this thinking of on the inside is okay, on the outside is bad is still there. We do get occasional reminders. We get reminders that uh, phishing is huge and the insider threat is always present, um, which is really feels like a betrayal of trust, and indeed it is. It's either the uh, insider actively being distrustful uh, or treasonous, or their uh, rights and privileges being stolen and abused. But that was the model that we were used to. So what is it, how does that change with today's enterprise? Well, today's enterprise, uh, I, I like to think of is has to be almost internet cafe ready. We have to assume that the infrastructure is compromised and compromisable and cannot be trusted. So we go from a world where we say, here's where the safe zone is and here's where the unsafe zone is to there is no safe zone. The, the perimeter in effect has shrunk down to the laptop and has now gone even smaller than that or the phone or the, or the tablet. It has now shrunk down to the person. And so we try to beef up uh, the trust in the individual. We try to do better authorization. Um, and we try, to, um, we try to get more data autonomy. We, we are being required at the same time as we are decentralizing, that we become more prescriptive and able to say what happens to data, who can see it, and how is it controlled. And so this is the new enterprise. And um, I refer to the phase that's coming up as, uh, and this, I, hopefully this doesn't date too quickly, but we've gone from pre-COVID-19, still in the tail end of the perimeter thinking, into a COVID-19 work from home world where suddenly the VPN uh, help, help desk ticket queue soared like it was 2001 all over again, or the password reset requests soared into a phase three where we potentially could be working from anywhere, bouncing in and out of the office, um, perhaps having to shelter in place in a hotel in any number of places and be able to say, you know, I need to be able to connect over what's available. I need to be able to still get my job done. I need to still connect with my family. I need to still live my life or be a student. And so that's the challenge today. And that means remote work is key, that we effectively have to be able to work regardless of platforms. We have to be able to have a persistent and consistent form of identity. 
we have to be able to uh, be able to make the attestations that we have that we need, and we need to make sure that when we're hit, that we are in fact attacked, that the damage is is mitigated and limited. Um, in the in the phase two, in this middle of the COVID, uh, you know, return to home, if you will, and working from home, uh, most of the bad guys, as we'll discuss in a moment, they have gone for the low hanging fruit. They've gone for things like phishing and DDoS attacks and the simple attacks, which have always worked in the past, but it's almost like there was a run on it. It is now is the shelf life before it expires. Use it. And now they've invested, as we'll see, in some more insidious forms of attacks. And uh, we can expect uh, new things to be targeted uh, rather than just the traditional in the next phase as R&D on the dark side has ramped up. So... Attacks, I have to say, don't stop at a single endpoint. They um, they go far beyond that. The uh, I talked earlier about the, the you know the the misapprehension caused by Hollywood movies. Um, the goal isn't to compromise a laptop and make some money. Yeah, in some ways, ransomware does that, um, but I consider that retrograde. I consider it um, just an optical trick where things appear to be going the other way. Even ransomware itself isn't used just for smash and grab for money. It's often used as a form of triggering of automated IT responses to destroy forensic evidence. So if, a, if an advanced attacker is in a network and they think you're onto them, they will pull the pin on the proverbial grenade and they will drop behind them ransomware so that the IT department cleans up the evidence. So the ultimate goal isn't the compromise of the endpoint, but ownership of it provides optionality for actors. Whether someone is a rogue nation state or an agency uh, associated with a nation, perhaps at arm's length, or whether they're hacktivists, or um, whether they're criminal, cyber criminals, optionality, the ability to have uh, options and resources available is critical. And that is directly proportional to bandwidth and systems and data access, whether or not they fully mine it. But the goal isn't the endpoint. And that brings us to mobile. Mobile malware is, uh, is the new chic in many ways. We, we've seen the move in classic attacks from traditional malware to uh, polymorphic uh, threats and ve attack vectors to fileless malware. But mobile is a platform that is underdefended, and uh, frankly, most solutions that are deployed on mobile today and that have evolved over the last 10 to 15 years are largely IT management and configuration management tools. Mobile threats go deep in the system. Uh, they go low in the stack. There are multiple chipsets in most mobile devices, and mostly the, uh, the uh, operating systems that are in use are, are completely new territory. Um, and so it, it really is a, a wild frontier in the uh, world of mobile malware as a vector that can connect to everything, especially as we've gone home. As people went home and they brought those assets that had never been outside the corporate perimeter before, uh, which a lot of people that's true of. Almost every company has some remote workers even before this, but there was a large number of people that weren't remote. Um, the first thing they would turn to is expanding the other device they knew really well, which was using the phone. And that means that compromises of phones and attack vectors and even getting rogue apps like the World Health Organization um, uh, pretend app that came out around COVID-19, um, this has been a huge spike and needs to be protected. And they don't stop evolving. The bad guys have R&D departments. The adversaries are constantly innovating and they do so with, uh, without much distraction. They get results. Uh, defenders, on the other hand, have many masters. They have to do things like compliance reports and, and uh, you have to do your HR training and you have to do all the things you do as an employee. But the attackers are single-mindedly focused and innovating in order to find new vectors and to pivot to those that work. So a quick timeline of malware adoption. Um, I will just say here that uh, it has been an exponential increase over the years. It has gone up by orders of magnitude uh, every decade, perhaps not as aggressive a growth as, uh, as Moore's Law um, in, in its domain. But nevertheless, we've seen it go from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands. And I remember the moment we hit a million viruses, and it wasn't that long later that we got to a million in a month and then a million in a week and eventually a million in a day. Uh, and so we've seen it go exponentially up, meaning the old way of trying to find things simply by looking for variants of what had passed before has been harder. And they've gone deeper into systems. And I want to emphasize that. I remember the advent, not just of spyware, but rootkits that could go low and deep and hide and, and enable uh, or, uh, attackers to fight back. Uh, 
And so this is not gonna change. This is not suddenly gonna reach an asymptote and say, okay, we're good enough. No, they're gonna go in new directions as well. But we haven't stopped evolving either. I think it's important to note that, that the security industry is, uh, is constantly evolving and that this should be a value of all of us, that we should expect to be in a race. And so this is not the a competition between our static defenses and the tools that are used for, for a standard attack. Instead, it's the first and second derivative of our innovation that I, I believe that we should be measuring our health and our ability to adapt and to run the race. It's not a sprint. It's not even a marathon. It's a series of marathons. I remember meeting marathon runners years ago who ran in, in, in my own local marathon, Boston Marathon, and seeing them the day after the marathon, and I would have imagined them cooling it. Uh, no, they got up and went for a run. That's amazing to me when you read about the pain that they endure in marathons. Health in human beings is measured in our resilience, and the same is true in security. And this is why an emphasis on making the system as efficient as it can be, the things I said earlier, at being able to stop bad guys and to tune it and to apply human intelligence and defense. I have a pet peeve. I don't believe that I'm waiting for silicon intelligence and a perfect AI to come out to solve the problem. Instead, I'm accepting that health and security is found by applying human beings more effective and efficiently, and that requires us to adapt. And so um, if you look at the solutions and how they've evolved, we, we likewise have improved. And I think we finally get that we went from antivirus and my own role in the personal firewall and in, in AV in the early days, prototyping new tools and getting to next-gen AV, getting host-based intrusion prevention systems and anti-spyware. Um, that we were able to start looking at EDR uh, in particular, where I today spend a lot of my time and effort, but also behavioral analysis and new tools. And I'm excited about the tools that are coming for the future as we build the right platform um, that isn't just a SIM, which is where we send events and sort them out afterwards, but instead we focus on that primary mission to be able to say, this is about more than just the next wall. It's more than just an ultimate um, uh, uh, central nervous system. Instead, it's about a focused machine to help us as practitioners get ahead. So this is about security for everything. And, th and that, means, uh, that means that we aren't just doing the endpoint, we aren't just doing the enterprise, but we need to go and take telemetry from everywhere. It has to come from the, uh, the internet of things, it has to come from the medical world, it has to come from things like drones, it has to come from services, it has to come from all over, and it has to be put into a platform that is behaviorally sorting intelligently and assisting the human. I hope the A in AI comes to mean assisted intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence because the intelligence, the carbon-based Mark I human being who's an analyst can be made a more effective cyber warfighter than we can <clears throat> ever get for the foreseeable future uh, an AI to do it for us. It is a far more complex game than chess or even Go and the cyber conflict of the 21st century. Now, one day we will solve the Turing challenge and uh, assuming that that is a benign artificial intelligence and assuming that it wants the job of analyst, it can do that and we will be able to retire. But until that day, this is our job and it must take it in data from everywhere. So the key takeaways for me is that the environment is changing. Let's keep that in mind. Let's see that the terrain and the meteorological report are not gonna be the same tomorrow as they were yesterday. That cyber attacks are evolving and that we collectively must move towards a security for everything mentality and continue to adapt and be good at that first and second derivative in a mathematical sense of security rather than ever finding the ultimate reference architecture. So with that, I'd like to thank you. I look forward to talking to you in the future. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is quite simple. It's sam at cyberreason, spelled as you see it here, dot com. And my Twitter handle is sam at sam j curry. I look forward to hearing from you and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show.